Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 4, Episode 18, titled Badge of Dishonor. We have a few of those throughout the run of this show. There's a few badges of dishonors. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually been quite a while since we've had the Crooked Cop Yes, story. it has. Yeah, we're a while in here. It originally premiered on March 18th, 1988. Now, this is where it's going to get really interesting, and I'm intrigued to see what you guys think. It is written by Dick Wolf with teleplays by Michael Duggan and Peter Lance. All three of those are either producers, showrunners, or story, or the head story editor. Like They are the cream of the crop when it comes to Vice. They are, they are at the top of the food chain, I, I should say. Well, I mean, should I mean this should be like the best Vice episode of the season then? It should have. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, because the director is Richard Compton, who also directed Down for the Count Part 1 and 2, Everybody's in Showbiz, The Big Thaw, but he's also got three (laughs) more episodes coming. (laughs) It's just really interesting to me that there were such heavyweights for Vice in the writer's room and in directing that were involved in this episode. Was it A, because they had an outline and like, would they pick that one out? Like Dick Wolf picked that up. It's like, I, I want to work on that one. Or is it B, Dick Wolf wrote yeah. it. And so then all the bosses were like, well, we got to do this one. Because Dick Wolf wrote it. Yeah. yeah. I have a different theory because something you'll notice when we get the guest stars is there's a certain amount of recycling in this episode <laughs> as far yeah. as who they used. And so I think this was more... We need another episode to fit into the season, you know, for this week. And so we don't have a big guest star. We don't have like big thing, a big song and music, really. We need a really good story to try and make this (laughs) thing work. (laughs) Like all hands on deck. We have nothing else going for us. (laughs) Well, this is also the last episode that premieres on Friday nights, like Friday at nine. So I think at this point, because we're almost to the end of season four, like ratings have really taken a dive. Yeah, and then they get drastic. And, they're trying mm-hmm, like, okay, let's change the time. Yeah. We miss Tubbs. Tubbs doesn't get a whole lot of stuff to do in season four. And this is a pretty Tubbs heavy episode. Very happy to see Tubbs the man in his I lo- really I love expensive suit. Tubbs the man in his expensive suit and his beard. Yes. Making <laughs> Crockett look like a waiter or something. <laughs> <laughs> let's go talk about this week's episode. All right, John, not only do we have music, but we have two bands that we've never had before. So it's this is actually a really good way to follow up a week of no music. Yeah, no, we've actually got some new bands we've never talked about before. And we're going to start off with the song Glory, Glory by Underworld. Underworld's a British electronic music group formed in 1980. Their principal members are Carl Hyde and Rick Smith, and then pretty much just a rotation of different people. They began their partnership in 1979 with a band called Screen Gems. Along with several members of that of Screen Gems, they would form a new wave band whose name was just a graphic squiggle. So <laughs> if you if you actually it, that this band is awesome when it comes to names and you, you i'm gonna have plenty more fun ones but that that is pretty cool you should look up that graphics squiggle because it's, it's kind of funny you know you'll, <laughs> you'll instantly get the reference so but they pronounced the squiggle friar <laughs> doesn't sound phallic at all to me <laughs> they released one album and then they actually disbanded in 86 when their second album get us out of here was uh withheld by the record company and i believe they would eventually get it released but it would prompt them in 87 to form underworld which was named after a clive barker script film the movie they're named after was scored by Friar or mm. Graphic Squiggle. <laughs> <sighs> so kind of explains why they chose the name. They would release several albums pretty quick. They, they'd release Under the Radar in 88 and 89's Change the Weather. And those would feature their first hit, Doot Doot. <laughs> <laughs> We're winning with names now. <laughs> so that version would actually come to an end as they would do another lineup change and add in 1991 DJ Darren Emerson. They actually went out and recruited him, and fans often know this as the MK2 version of Underworld. So pretty much they would go from 
more electronic new wave to kind of being more danceable techno, which I thought was funny that this author made a point to, to talk about, to list the difference as if there was a difference between danceable techno and electronica. Uh, electronica. <laughs> they would stay together as a trio. They would release albums in the 90s. All right, so this first album name is all one word. It is Dub No Bass With My Head Man. Okay. <laughs> all one word. No they need would, for spacing. All one word. Yes, no spacing. So it's pronounced dub my bass with my headband. <laughs> they would also release my favorite album of theirs, Second Toughest in the Infants. <laughs> they got quite the album names. <laughs> yes. Uh, and that's it. They would actually uh, achieve a degree of commercial success with that one, mostly because some of the music would be featured in the movie. Train spotting. The songs Dark and Long and Born Slippy Period X, which, by the way, Born Slippy Nux is their most successful track to date. <laughs> the names. 1999, after releasing their fifth album, Bo Coop Fish. <laughs> now they're just making shit up. Yeah, now they just got <laughs> out of control. After releasing the album, Hyde would declare in an interview that he had dealt with some of his alcohol issues. The sessions were fraught with problems as the members of the band were insisted on working in their own studios and just passing raw material back and forth. That album would not do quite as well because of the disparity in the band, although one of the songs would appear on the soundtrack for the movie Vanilla Sky. Around that same time, Emerson would leave the group and the group would continue as just a duo with Hyde and Smith. They would release an uh, album, 100 Days Off, and then they would do some online-only releases, consistently making music, releasing albums, but they also did the soundtrack to the 2006 movie, Sunshine. They would also work again with director Danny Boyle to provide songs for Train Spotting 2 soundtrack, as well as Smith would provide the soundtrack for Boyle's movie, 2013 movie, Trance, mm. as well as Danny Boyle's BBC show he was involved with, Babylon. Ah. Smith would do the theme for that. On top of all of that, uh, they would also compose, be asked to compose uh, songs for the 2012 Olympic opening ceremony, in which they would also collaborate with Danny Boyle. Move on to the other song in the episode, Eyes of a Stranger by the Paolas. Paolas are part of, were part of the Vancouver New Wave scene in Canada from the late 70s throughout the 80s. They would also have a reunion in the early 2000s. The name of the band refers to the Paola scandal in the U.S. in the early 60s. The primary members of the band are Paul Hyde and Bob Rock. Now, Paul Hyde, even though this band is from Vancouver, Canada, I cannot rule out him being somehow related to Carl Hyde from the last band, Underworld, being that they're both British and were both born in similar proximity, but no <laughs> articles would confirm. So from one Hyde to the other Hyde, we have Bob Paul Hyde and Bob Rock, the two had met in high school uh, when they formed the band. And while Bob was working as a record engineer for Little Mountain Sound Studios, they recorded their first single, China Boys, in 1979. That single would get them noticed by A&M Records. They would also have to kind of reform as... The people they recorded it with all quit the band. Paul and Hyde would put together a new band with A&M Studios, and they would release their debut album, 1980s, Introducing Paolas. They would release a number of albums and see a lot of success in Canada, but they would have a hard time breaking into the U.S., one of the theories is that because their name was the Payola Scandal, because that had a lot to do about radio, that radio stations wouldn't play their music because they didn't want to actually have to talk about or mention <laughs> Scandal. <laughs> so they're doing this the exact same thing to them to avoid talking about the scandal. Yeah, exactly. They also tried different versions of, the, of their name. Uh, in 1985, aside from... 
bringing in David Foster, who was a pop music guru. They would also let Hyde's wife write some songs. And they would also change their name to be known as Paul Hyde and the Payolas, and eventually Rockin' Hyde. (laughs) Uh, But all those changes would fall a little short as they would release the album, Here's the World for Ya, and it would pretty much be a dud. Except for... Quincy Jones would commission them for a song for one, for an African Relief Fund project. <clears throat> that song would be Tears Are Not Enough. It would become a number one hit in Canada as it was co-wrote, co-written with, as Iden Rock co-wrote it with Adams, several other, uh, Brian Adams and several other notable artists. But it was clearly, it hit number one because Brian Adams was, in, was involved. Exactly. I mean, Exactly, because Brian Adams is a treasure for the world. Everyone loves Brian Adams, and he is the greatest thing that ever happened. And not this very <laughs> uncomfortable conversation I had with my wife earlier this week, who said that she doesn't like Brian Adams. I didn't say I didn't like what? him. I just I. <laughs> <laughs> the only people that don't like Brian Adams right now are you and Trump. <laughs> Well, I mean, actually, I didn't say I didn't that I didn't like him. I just said I don't understand what all the hype was. Sorry, he's no Rod Stewart. What do you better. want me to say? <laughs> I'm no Rod Stewart. That's it. I quit. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. I'm leaving. He's just digging a deeper hole now. <laughs> he's no Sting. I said it there. I and I don't take that back. <laughs> the police aren't very good. You heard it here. Brian Adams is better than Yeah, I'm sure you're going to get hate mail because of Brian Adams, <laughs> not because he said the police. Don't you guys just love the music segment? Oh, uh, <laughs> if, if we did get hate mail, this is where it would all come. The, the music segment, breaking up marriages all over. <laughs> yes. yes. Let's see who else we insult. We've already got one guy who's, who, who will probably sue us eventually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In 1987, they would rebrand as Rockin' Hide, and after being dropped by AM Records, they would release Under the Volcano with EMI, and they would work with Bruce Fairburn, who also produced music for Bon Jovi and Aerosmith. They would finally release this critically acclaimed, well received album that would have hits in both Canada and the US. So it's like they finally did it, guys. They broke into the U.S. market, (laughs) they toured a little bit, and then they would strangely take a hiatus for no apparent reason from 1989 to 2003. (laughs) <laughs> that is uh that they nicknamed the long hiatus. So yeah, they finally broke into the US market and got some songs to chart and then they just stopped making music together. Rock would produce bands, he would focus on producing and produce bands like Motley Crue and Metallica. Yeah. While Hyde would start releasing solo stuff, often with either having Rock help form instrumentals or produce. So, but they would not make music together as the Payolas until 2003 when they would release a reunion seven song EP called Langford Part One. Unfortunately, there would never be a Langford Part Two <laughs> as in 2008 the band would stop performing, in 2009 their website would be shut down. <laughs> And in 2009, Hyde would also resume his solo career. But I just love that. They finally got started getting recognition in the U.S. It's like, okay, we did it. Cool. Let's go do other stuff. <laughs> there you go. There is there is the story of the two Hydes, who probably aren't related, but I like to think they are. Well, John, I think we can all say that we're just happy that music has returned to Miami Vice and that we're happy to have a music segment again. And any time it mentions Brian Adams in one way or another is a great music segment. <laughs> yes. Yes. We love Brian Adams, even if not all of us, even if only two thirds of us do. Just like only two thirds so. like Noogie and nobody else. <laughs> Just saying. By the, the way, on a side note, it, it, on that it, one. Paul Hyde or Bob Rock, if by any chance you are listening to this, we're still waiting for Lingford Part 2. <laughs> Anytime now, boys. <laughs> and 
that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. Email us, goWithTheHeat at gmail.com, facebook.com slash goWithTheHeat, twitter.com slash goWithTheHeat, Instagram at goWithTheHeat. You can find us in any of those locations. We would love to hear from you. You want to get us on Anchor, on the Anchor.fm app, we're on there. You want to get us on your tubes, you just yell, go up to your neighbor's window, <laughs> yell into it, hey, fill in the Echo, the Amazon Assistant, or the Google Home, play the latest Miami Vice podcast, and just share the wealth. Just <laughs> yell into people's windows as you walk down the street. Just yell to their phones, say, hey, Siri. And then let them know which podcast they should be listening to. <laughs> Just yell it out everywhere you go. <laughs> be sure to check out that website, go with the heat.com. You can find all the other ways that you can subscribe to the show and all the other ways that you can find us. Like I mentioned, we would love to hear from you. And you can also show your support. You can go to that website, click, click, click on support and find out how you can support us. Support number one, send us your feedback. We'd love to hear from you. Support number two, go to your podcast, your platform of choice and leave us a review. Just give us the highest ranking. That's all that anyone cares about. Just give us the five stars, but do not write a review. No one ever reads the review. So instead, in the review instead, section. Instead, tell us how much you love Brian Adams. <laughs> <laughs> Just make it an ode to Brian Adams as, as deep cut in the summer of 69, how much you loved Brian Adams. Because apparently he's going to teach you all about how the ways that you need to love a woman. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pals.